first Wheatland seminar of the spring semester. Uh, most of you know me, but I'm Tony Gway with the Wheatland Lab uh, here at the School of Forest Resources. And this afternoon, um, we're very fortunate to have one of our own with us, uh, Elias Airy, a PhD candidate in Forest Resources. Uh, just as part of his introduction, a few fun facts before I turn it over to Elias. I'm from New Jersey, uh, has an undergrad degree in ecology from SUNY uh, Binghamton. Uh, he also, uh, there's a remote possibility that, that he found the world's oldest fossilized tree on a fossil hunt in 2012. Uh, another fun fact, um, he, uh, let's see here, um, found the world's tallest wild uh, American chestnut tree in 2015 while flying spotting missions uh, for the American Chestnut Foundation with Brian Roth. I uh, came to UMaine in 2013 to pursue a master's degree under Sean, um, and uh, they didn't really, really know what to do with Elias until they learned of this uh, really cool LiDAR data set that had just been acquired. Uh, his master's work dealt with the segmentation of individual trees in LiDAR, developing tree lists for every tree in the Penobscot experimental course. Uh, he has a private pilot's license and a small drone, um, and his PhD work, uh, working under Dan Hayes, uh, has uh, been to develop forest inventories of New England using increasingly complicated uh, approaches, which include finding new ways to measure LIDAR in ecologically meaningful ways, uh, the use of convolutional neural networks uh, to interpret LIDAR, uh, applying these neural networks to make maps of New England forests using LIDAR and satellite data, and using generative adversarial neural networks, uh, fancy AI, uh, to synthesize new LIDAR point clouds and projecting them forward and backwards in time. So with that, I'll turn it over to Elias. Thanks. Thanks for coming out. Um, yeah, so this is uh, supposed to be kind of the rollout of the forest inventory maps that I've been basically developing for the past four years. Uh, and it's going to be different than the talk that I'm going to give in May, which is going to be my defense, um, in that uh, this talk is going to be really uh, heavily centered on the maps and what we can do with them. And I'm not really going to talk too much about the actual methodology behind it, because I don't want to bore all you guys with my work talk. Um, so in that sense, uh, the talk is actually going to be kind of given backwards. We're going to talk about results first, look at some of the maps, and then if we have time, I will start boring your head off about neural networks. So in case you guys don't know, this is LiDAR. Um, I'm going to do just a quick introduction of what LiDAR is. So these are three-dimensional point clouds that can be visualized. Uh, and point clouds consist of a series of dots that represent objects in space. Oh, I clicked on the movie. All right, so how does LiDAR actually work? Well, uh, LiDAR, the LiDAR machine shoots a laser beam outward. It hits an object. It comes back. And the distance to that object can be measured because we know the speed of light. And if we do this over and over and over and over again uh, from a, uh, a vehicle or from a machine, then we can create these reconstructions of the world. Um, sometimes we shoot them out over 100,000 times per second. And each and every point in a LiDAR point cloud is a return from the laser that represents uh, an object in space. So that's your quick LiDAR introduction. Um, so today we basically have full coverage of New England. Um, this is a, a map of the current LiDAR coverage. The little patchy areas that are missing are gonna be flown in the next year or two, so hopefully we'll get that. Um, it is worth noting that some of it is getting quite old. Uh, so some of it's almost a decade old at this point, especially in, uh, on the coast. How are LiDAR inventories normally made? Well, um, I'm going to give you a really brief overview. The, the thing that people usually do is they take the LiDAR point cloud uh, and then they take a field plot and they, they couple the two. Uh, and then they'll take a series of height measurements over the LiDAR point cloud. So mean height, maximum height, 80th percentile of height, uh, the proportion of points above a certain height. Um, they will take those height measurements, correlate them with the field data to estimate whatever you're interested in. So for example, stem volume. And then they'll, they'll create basically a model that can then read in LiDAR points, measure those heights, and then predict volume or tree density or all kinds of different stuff um, across the entire landscape where you don't necessarily have field data. So that's kind of the traditional approach to doing things. 
Uh, I didn't actually use that approach. Mine is mostly the same in that I'm making a model from field data that predicts uh, LIDAR forest inventory attributes. Um, but I'm using neural networks that can identify features in the LIDAR themselves uh, rather than uh, measuring the height percentiles of a point cloud. So let's get to the heart of it. What forest attributes were actually estimated here? So I made maps of each of these 14 forest attributes, and some of them are better than others. Um, so we've got basal area, above ground biomass, total biomass, uh, mean tree height, QMD, quadratic mean diameter, uh, tree count, which is just the number of trees within a certain grid cell, uh, percent softwood, percent spruce fir, percent white pine. These refer to like the percentage of stems um, within a grid cell that belong to those categories, those species categories. Uh, volume, merchantable volume, and then volume breakdowns of different species. So hardwood volume, spruce fir volume, and white pine volume. Um, why did I pick these in particular? Well, uh, no real good reason. I mean, we started with a couple that we knew we wanted to work with, and then people just kept on asking me if you could do, if you could estimate how much white pines were out there, so I just, I tacked it on. Um, uh, of note, all of the estimates that I made were on trees greater than 10 centimeters in diameter. So when we're talking tree count, I'm not actually talking about the number of little saplings, it's the number of merchantable trees. Um, QMD could get a little bit funny there if you're not, calculating it with trees smaller than 10 centimeters in diameter, but I think it's okay. So which trees, which forest attributes did I not estimate? Uh, saw log size or piece size. Um, I, I didn't really have the field data and I didn't really have much impetus to do it. Um, and it, the equations to go from what I had, the field data I had to like piece size weren't really straightforward, so I got rid of it. Uh, regen. Uh, these maps don't show anything about regen. Like I said, everything is for 10 centimeters or greater. Um, regen plots and field data are taken. I mean, everybody's got their own method for sampling regen, so I, I didn't want to touch it. But certainly these are things that could be modeled with LIDAR. Diameter distributions. This, this one I kind of wish that I, I had done. Um, some people make these LIDAR models and then for every grid cell they have a, a predicted diameter distribution. Um, and it's, it's tremendously useful. You can then start like estimating like individual trees within the grid cell and stuff. Um, I didn't do it for two reasons. The first is that I'm working on 10 by 10 meter grids. So how do you get a nice diameter distribution with like two trees? It's, you have to start like looking at the trees outside the grids and stuff. Um, and then the second reason is that the way that often people do this is they kind of estimate the, the coefficients of a, of a curve, of the actual diameter distribution curve. Um, and that didn't really jive that well with the deep learning stuff I was doing. So unfortunately, uh, no diameter distributions on my maps. Um, and then the other thing that I really, I wanted to estimate but couldn't was stumpage. It would have been really cool to be able to say, you know, the forests of Maine are worth exactly this many dollars. I think that would have been kind of impactful. Um, but again, stumpage can be kind of circumstantial and it requires like estimates of like species that we didn't necessarily have and tree quality that we didn't necessarily have. So I think it's worth trying in the future, but it's not a map that I could make. Uh, I didn't estimate health or vigor, but I do get asked a lot if I could estimate health or vigor. Uh, the answer is that LIDAR itself does not do a very good job of estimating the vigor of trees because it's basically looking at the structure. Um, you can see spectral decline from satellites and I did use satellite data in these models um, but in general, I don't expect that there'd be very good results if I tried to estimate the bigger trees, nor do I have the field data to do it. Uh, this is defoliation from gypsy moth in uh, Rhode Island before and after from uh, satellites. And then detailed species breakdowns. Um, you saw that I estimated white pine, I estimated spruce fir, not spruce or fir, but just spruce fir, um, and the percentage of conifers. Um, I, I don't think I can go any further than that. In fact, I really didn't do a very good job of estimating white pine or spruce fir in general. Um, it, again, sh this kind of like structural information is really hard to tease out from LIDAR. I can't personally tell which species these particular trees are, and so I wouldn't really expect even a neural network to be able to tell which species of trees these are. Uh, same with moderate satellite, moderate resolution satellites. If you're using Sentinel or Landsat, it's really pretty difficult to get at like the individual species contents. 
Um, so we're not we're not quite there. You, you generally you kind of need like hyperspectral data to start working with that. And then finally, the 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 last like forest attribute that I think is important that I that I couldn't actually model was stem form. Um, this is uh, kind of tough to actually estimate. I, I I made a little algorithm to try to find stems from individual trees during my master's work. Um, but it requires a lot of structural information that isn't necessarily there in the LIDAR. So it, using my mask right now, you can definitely tell uh, what areas are, for example, like really large white pine stands, but you cannot tell if they're high quality wood or if they're low quality wood, which gets back to the problem of actually estimating the value and stuff, um, because value is, you know, varies enormously based on just the quality of the stem. So let's talk about the actual performance numbers. Um, the best estimates were estimates of tree size pretty consistently. So basal area, biomass, tree height, uh, mean diameter, volume, merchant volume, uh, these, were, these all did fairly well. Um, yeah, I, one, could, one could think of a couple of reasons why that is. Uh, yeah, any, anyway. Uh, if, if, if we're looking for comparisons as to how well, how good these models did, um, for example, we had a, a master's student uh, last year graduate who, who did a bunch of biomass modeling with Landsat imagery and disturbance history. Uh, his above ground biomass model, for example, was uh, 50 megagrams per hectare, whereas mine's 36 and it's a, a ninth of the, the resolution is nine times better than, than his. Um, so these are by and far the best maps of the region, especially for tree size. Um, I can tell you really accurately how many pounds of wood are in the forest. Dan wanted me to do like a comparison with like, this is how many aircraft carriers are in Penobscot County and stuff. So <laughs> didn't have time for that. Okay. Um, there were some, there were some estimates that kind of did so-so. So tree count estimates, percent softwood and, uh, hardwood volume estimates. Um, they, they were kind of okay. You know, the root mean spread air as a percent of mean was like 50s and 60s and that you know that's not great but that's also not terrible um they were much more prone to like mapping errors so you can start to see kind of the maps break down in areas where um for example the lidar was really old um what would happen is that particularly along the coast where the lidar was flown to a really low pulse density sometimes one pulse per meter or less um and the scan angle would often get very high but what happened is the LIDAR wouldn't actually penetrate that deeply into the forest. So you get kind of like a skimming of the surface in a low pulse density, high scan angle environment. And when that happened, because these attributes are all attributes that rely on horizontal measurements of the LIDAR, if that horizontal measurement is kind of lost, uh, then you know, your, att your attributes are gonna suffer. Um, tree size, on the other hand, is really just a measure, it, you know, you can correlate height pretty well with tree size. So, um, these maps did very well in the, in the newer LIDAR areas. So for example, all this area of Northern Maine, this area of uh, New Hampshire, uh, because those were all flown to four pulses per meter or higher. Um, and then there were some maps that just didn't work that well. Um, you know, I, you always want to include them. And some of them are, are not so bad in a uh, uh, qualitative sense. So the percent spruce fir and the percent white pine breakdowns, not so great. And then the spruce fir volume and the white pine volume was just, was just completely off. Um, now, I would say that the percent spruce fir and the percent white pine, uh, you can look at these maps. Uh, you get these large regional biases with different pulse, with different lighter pulse densities and stuff. But when you, when you zoom in, you can often see areas that have you know, greater white pine than others. So if you're just a forester standing in the field, these maps are not that bad. Also, if you're going to take these maps and kind of bend them into like low, medium, high, then you can get some extra value out of them. I don't even know. Phil. <laughs> it's not good. I was wondering why it was staying on the screen for an extra second. No reason. Yeah. So, Elias, about the rating, those different colors of the sharp edges on that last slide is due to the LIDAR collection? Uh, yeah, those are different LIDAR acquisitions that just have varying parameters. And really what you're seeing here are these low density areas where there's like massive uh, overestimation. Um, but again, this is only on, a, you know, these are, these are only on some of these maps. The, all the maps that quantified like tree size, you don't really get too much problem. Um, all right. 
So I, we wanted to compare the performance of these maps to like FIA county level estimates, because this is kind of like the gold standard for estimating, for example, the amount of biomass within a, the county or the, the country. Um, you can see here that most counties were actually, uh, they actually did fall within uh, the FIA's like 95% confidence interval of their, their estimates of biomass. Um, so all the blue counties are within the 95% confidence, and yellow counties are within 97.5, and red counties are different. Um, one thing that was kind of interesting to find is that my maps seem to be doing a considerably better job than the FIA in estimating urban and suburban areas. Uh, FIA doesn't even bother uh, taking samples in urban areas and in suburban areas, which uh, they do this really terrible thing where they just throw a plot out there and they don't visit the plot and they just assume there's no trees on it. And that's really skewing their estimates. <laughs> um, so we'll take a look at that in a second. But uh, I did the same thing with percent softwood. Now here, like I said, this was one of the so-so models. Um, what, you, what you see happening here is, especially up in Maine where there's a lot of softwoods, uh, we're kind of seeing an underestimation of the percent softwood, um, which I guess is to kind of be expected if you're kind of fitting a model to the mean. Uh, there might be a little bit of an overestimation percent softwood over in Vermont and stuff where there aren't any softwood trees. Um, essentially, you know, when there's 100% softwood, it's estimating that there's 90, for example. Uh, and then we also looked at tree number uh, or tree count, which is just like the number of trees within a given grid cell. Um, and I think that these were pretty good, but you're still kind of seeing a trend where in counties with a lot of trees, so the uh, Penobscot and Piscataway County kind of have a lot of trees because they're industrial forests and they're further north and you get more like uh, uh, more stands that have been recently harvested and stuff. Um, there's kind of an underestimation of, of, of uh, tree count. So. We can also kind of visualize this by looking at the error of the maps. So our biomass map, the error looks pretty good. Our percent softwood map, we're, we're seeing it start to break down in Washington County where there's a ton of softwood trees. Uh, and our tree count, once again, kind of underestimated in the industrial forests of Maine. So, so I wanna talk about map errors. Uh, we're gonna take a look at the maps as soon as I get through all these, but. Uh, I want to prepare you ahead of time for some of the problems you may see. Um, so there were a couple different types of map errors. For one, the first thing is that uh, acquisition overlap. So LIDAR acquisitions didn't always nicely overlap. Uh, in Massachusetts, for example, they left a one and a half kilometer gap between two of their LIDAR acquisitions. It was very annoying. Um, in the Penobscot Experimental Forest, we're seeing the old uh, NOAA LIDAR and the new state LIDAR uh, kind of not quite jiving. Some of this is the contractor, and some of this is uh, my mosaicing method didn't always pick like the right one to go with. So, uh, missing tiles. I had to mosaic a hundred thousand. I had to process a hundred thousand lidar tiles for this project, um, and some of them just went off from the stray. They all ended up processed, but the mosaicing is where some of them got dropped out. And I've I've learned that mosaicing a hundred thousand rasters is actually really really difficult. Um, I. I didn't really come up with a great solution to do it. Um, I mean, I managed it, but there's still like mosaicing errors and missing tiles. And, but if you, if you are interested in an area that is missing, just email me because that data was, was calculated. And then banding. This is the, this is the error that kept me up at night. Um, like I said, in, in like the lower quality, lower density areas, especially where pulse density decreased and scan angle was pretty high, um, stem density and species estimates, uh, you could see this kind of banding. And that's basically like a systematic uh, underestimation uh, in these, in these uh, along the flight line in, like the, in the uh, higher scan angle regions of the flight line. Uh, and then there were LIDAR errors. Um, and this also bothered me a lot uh, because some of these were just like the contractor like messed it up. There's a big strip in Eastern Maine. I don't know if anyone's interested in the land out there um, where the contractor just like obviously didn't fly it with the correct vegetation settings. The same with Connecticut. Um, there's uh, the, the lighter machine was just like not, not set right, obviously. That's all I can say. Um, but I, I'd, like to, I'd like to look on the bright side here because I've just like been ripping on my maps for the past 10 slides. Um, a lot of these, these banding issues and these like systematic biases that I just pointed out, 
um, they're not that great a deal, deal in terms of like actual numbers. So do we really care if we're estimating 65% or 70% softwood in a 10 meter grid cell? Probably not. Um, uh, yeah, so I would, I would say that in a lot of these cases with, with like the maps that have banding, what you really want to do anyway is categorize them into like low, medium, high, or maybe like five different categories of like low, medium, high. So percent softwood, for example, you can break it down and just say like lowest, low, medium, highest, high. Uh, and that would probably solve a lot of the banding issues in there anyway. And then some of the, the kind of bad maps that I was talking about, like the percent spruce fir map, um, resampled, it looks quite good. Um, so the reason for this is that, I mean, partially the landscape itself is uh, kind of heterogeneous. Um, you know, if you go out to a, a pure spruce fir, fir stand if you, and look at like the 10 by 10 meter grid cells, a lot of those cells are not going to have 100% spruce fir. So if you actually do aggregate it to like a, a 40 meter resolution, for example, a lot of the species maps start looking a lot more realistic. Um, and then even the, the white pine maps can be made to look pretty decent and pretty informative of where white pines are. This is the raw white pine map, but all you have to do is aggregate it and start getting reasonable estimates of where white pines are growing on the landscape. All right, so this, this concludes my, uh, my background into these maps. I'm gonna try to start talking about ways that we can visualize, work with, and then kind of use these in, in a, like a real setting. Um, so the first kind of visualization tool that I thought was really cool, and the only one here that's going to get this is Dan, um, is we, we can actually take these maps and we can combine them into one color image. So we've got a map of biomass, we've got a map of uh, tree count, we've got a map of percent softwood, and we can take them and we can combine them. We can put percent softwood in the red band, we can put uh, tree count in the green band, and we can put uh, volume in the blue band. And then you get you get an immediate like really cool visualization, and I can look at any pixel on this map and say like exactly oh it's got uh, softwood trees that are large and a high density. Um, so it takes a little bit of intuiting. Um, so uh, for example here, like I said, percent softwood is in red, tree count is in green, volume is in blue. So for example, purple cells. If we're looking at the up here, we got some purple cells up here. That's the stand out there. That is a high volume uh, conifer stand. So we've got blue and red being combined to make purple. Um, we can find just blue, which is high volume deciduous. We can find green, which is uh, high density uh, conifer. Uh, so it's really kind of cool. Uh, this is kind of the breaking point that I wanted to actually stop and try to visualize some of these maps. Uh, I really want to drive home the point to you. I know some of you guys have been sitting in these rooms and listening to these presentations for like five or six years now and looking at maps that you can't actually use. These are real maps and we can like pull them up and play with them on the fly. So this is my biomass map, which is the best. Uh, I spent a lot of time fiddling with biomass in particular, so that's why it's the best. Um, we can zoom in to Boston here. It's kind of a cool thing to visualize. Uh, I cropped out buildings. Hope it uh, loads in relatively quickly. Uh, Ryan, can you just take a second and explain what platform you're using here? For uh, so this is Google Earth Engine. Um, it can be used to manipulate large rasters and, and work with satellite imagery and stuff. But really, I'm, I, what I'm doing here is just visualizing the data. And it's fantastic for just like loading up data and visualizing it very quickly on top of satellite imagery. So we can see that the above ground biomass in Boston, not so great in the, in, in the inner city, but then you can see some parks and stuff where the, the biomass is greater. Um, see, these like suburban areas are where this model really starts to shine because there's a lot of trees in here which are just not being sampled by the FIA. Uh, let's turn this off. See all the trees there that are popping out. Anyway, um, so we can, we can zoom around. Let's go see the University of Maine. We can zoom around. We know that there's a lot of biomass in that stand right outside our building. We can see that. Um, the industrial forests uh, kind of down east and stuff, you can see a lot of cool, cool trends in like land ownership and stuff. Um, so that's the first kind of visualization tool. The second kind of visualization tool I wanted to show you is uh, the coloring, which is really cool. I'm not expecting you guys to get this immediately or even get it today because I got to move on. But um, it's really cool to be able to say, 
For example, in this red area, I know because it's red, there's high conifer. Because it's not purple, it's low density, and because it, or it's low volume, and because it's not uh, green, it's uh, low density. So this is a young conifer stand, for example. So I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, yeah. All right. We'll get back to the presentation now. All right, like I said, uh, one thing that you want to do with these maps, and some of them you want to do it more than others, is you want to reclassify them into bins. So for example, like percent white pine and tree count, where you see the maps kind of like breaking down into bands and stuff, you can classify them into like low, medium, high, and then get like a pretty good uh, like visualization of where your spans are uh, on the map. Just a quick and easy visualization tool. I know it's not that complicated a thing. Um, you could take it a step further and actually delineate stands. Um, so we've got all these as information. We've got like 14 different estimates for, for the whole forest. We can plug them into clustering algorithms that will cluster nearby like pixels together. Um, and nearby like pixels in mass are spans. Um, so we can use like existing computer vision algorithms. Even I've even heard of people trying to use uh, algorithms that are used to gerrymander to stands. Um, I used uh, a clustering algorithm called Slick uh, last night and attempted to cluster some stands. The thing about Slick is that all the stands will kind of be about the same size. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but this is just a quick example. These algorithms exist out there for computer vision already uh, and we can start using them to like uh, play around with stands. You can mess around with the parameters to get the stand size and minimum amount of pixels and stuff all you want. Um, now, with our stands, either derived from clustering or derived from like the traditional techniques of like, you know, sketch mapping and stuff, um, we can obviously take, uh, use like basic GIS uh, stuff to take like, uh, uh, create stand level summaries. So for example, with volume, we can calculate how much volume is in a stand, the mean volume of the stand, the total volume of the, sta uh, the, the standard deviation of the volume in the stand, um, all kinds of like pretty simple GIS stuff. Um, some cool tools have already been made that make it really easy for you to like draw stands and get like these great breakdowns. Um, I'm not making those tools, I'm just making the maps. Um, but this is another chance to play around with the maps live um, because we can take the maps, load in, and statistics. Uh, we can take the maps and just about anywhere that we're interested in, we could just draw you know, draw a, a boundary and get a bunch of estimates on them. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's, for example, uh, I don't know, let's just find an interesting stand. <laughs> we'll take this thing right here. Uh, we should be able to, yeah, this is harder to do on the <laughs> two screens. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna draw it here for you real quick. So talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> All right, so I've drawn our stand in real quick. Uh, we can run this little thing right here. Um, and it's not pretty because it's not a pretty interface that I made, uh, but we can get estimates. That's how many kilograms of biomass there is. I'm seeing uh, maybe 5.9 million. Uh, that's the percent spruce, uh, that's the percent softwood. Uh, that is, no, that's the percent softwood. Um, and we'll get, that's the number of trees, 35,000 trees within that stand. So my, the point is that you can really quickly uh, get these statistics over these in areas that you're interested in um, and then do whatever, and all kinds of stuff. With them. So back to the presentation. Now, I would say the furthest people are taking these things is that I've, I've now met, talked with like four different companies now that are actually creating tree lists from these inventories. Um, so basically, we've got all these attributes. We've got 14 different attributes for every single grid cell here. And they're using these to then impute uh, actual lists of trees within each grid cell. And, and the way that works um, is basically, we're gonna take our 14 attributes, we're gonna go back to our training data, we're gonna go back to the, the field data that we used to train this, and we're gonna find the grid cell that is most similar, to, or a couple of grid cells that are most similar to the cell that we're looking at. And from those most similar cells, we're gonna take the trees. 
And we're going to do this over and over and over again. Um, and within an entire stand, we can then populate it with like these hypothetical trees that are like derived from our, our training data. So we can, we can create tree lists for basically uh, every single grid cell that you see on the map. Uh, and then we can summarize this to stand level stuff, uh, obviously get diameter distributions that way. Um, we can take these and manipulate them in any way that we normally would. So we can project them forward in time with FBS and we can simulate different management schemes, different thinnings, and we can optimize our management uh, all around these kind of virtual tree lists. Um, that's what some people are doing. Uh, I, I would advise, there are, there, I, I have some words of warning for people who try to take these maps and make tree lists like that. Um, the way that it's taking trees from all over the training data, you could end up with some very odd forest assemblages. Um, and then I, I wouldn't necessarily say that the method is going to do the, the best in like extreme values. So if you have some really odd areas. Now remember, LIDAR doesn't do that great a job of estimating tree species. So you're gonna end up with like tree species next to one another that you wouldn't actually find in the field necessarily. But still, it's a, it's a cool technique and people seem to be having good results with it, so. Um, now these maps are also fantastic for all kinds of wildlife modeling. Um, we can make spatial and statistical models uh, uh, using these maps. Uh, Basically, any forest dwelling animal is gonna, is gonna have a habitat that's pretty well correlated with the things that I've uh, mapped here. Um, so I, I did this little case study in Connecticut. I had 150 plots in Connecticut with about 50 different bird abundances. Um, and then I, I made a couple of spatial models to predict the uh, locations of birds in Connecticut and Rhode Island. And the way that I did this, of course, is that we had the plot locations, we had the abundances for each plot. These are pretty standard things that you're going to measure in the field. And we can just extract the values of the map around it and then make a model predicting abundance from our various mapped attributes. Uh, so for example, uh, this is white pine warbler habitat that I was able to model real quickly. The map is not perfect. The thing about these maps, if you're going to make a model from all 14 maps, you're going to kind of aggregate error from all 14 of these maps as well. So you're going to see banding from all the, all the map. But still, uh, if you look at this map, you can see definite hot spots and dark spots. And compared to the, the maps that they were using, um, these are quite a bit better, I think. Uh, this is just kind of a close up. I was kind of proud of this. I, I whipped this out last night. So. Um, so you can still see banding errors and stuff, but you can definitely start picking out habitats. This is for white pine warbler. And I can tell you that it's not just picking out conifer stands, it's definitely focusing on a couple of different things. Uh, so what is it actually focusing on? Well, not only can we actually map the habitats of various species uh, from space, we can actually start like hypothesis testing, right? So if, if we have all this information about you know, where the, where the uh, species is, and then we have all this information derived from the maps, we can figure out uh, what habitat these, these animals prefer. So for example, our white pine warblers seem to prefer high volume forests. They seem to avoid spruce fir hemlock forests. They seem to avoid high density forests, avoid hardwood forests, and have no real preference for tree height. Um, so we can start actually like testing questions and start determining habitat rather than just mapping it. And I think this is, that was like the only slide you'll see without a map on it, so I appreciate it. Um, so that, that was my little wildlife bit here. Um, I want to talk about how th these maps are regional maps, right? Um, and, and any regional map is not going to be, is, is usually not going to be as good as a map that's like made specifically for your little area. So if you have field data in like Eastern Maine or something, and you're trying to take estimates off of my map and compare them to estimates off of a map that you made with your own field data in your own little area, uh, maybe my map won't do as well. But what you can do is calibrate these maps locally. And you can do this a lot easier then maybe uh, you know, restarting the whole modeling process. You could probably also do this with less plots. Um, so the kind of the simplest way we can do that is either by like modeling the residuals. So we can, we can take our, our plots and we can say that, all right, we're systematically underestimating biomass. Let's bump it up a little bit. Um, you can do this with a simple ratio or you can do this with a more complex linear model. Um, but what we can also do um, is you can kind of restart the neural network's training and you could retrain the neural network locally without having to go through the weeks of training that it took me. Um, and then you can create a neural network that's really good for your, your little local area, which is probably more effective, but definitely more uh, programming intense. Um, 
Now, this is this is a common thing in deep learning. I'm I don't want to talk too much about neural networks, but um, almost all the neural networks out there uh, are derived from these like early neural networks that could identify like objects and pictures. And so, for example, Google trains a neural network; it puts it up on the internet. And then if someone's trying to find cancer cells in an MRI, they'll take Google's neural network and they'll, they'll fine tune it to find cancer cells. And this is what I'm talking about. You can fine tune these models to like local environments and they'll do a little bit better. So how would these models perform if we actually like expanded it beyond New England? Um, this was an interesting question. Um, have we reached the range of, of what these models could do? Um, so I would say for the biomass, we can look at the residuals because that's if, if we see a lot of like <clears throat> hard residuals on the edges, then that's a pretty good indication that our maps are not going to work that well, you know, too far out. Um, I would say the biomass residuals are pretty well distributed, and this is an indication that the bio, that the, the tree size maps uh, could probably be extended pretty far outside of the New England range and get reasonable estimates because we're not seeing any any real spatial uh, differences. Uh, uh, in, in error. Um, now the percent conifer, we already saw that it's kind of underestimating in high percent conifer stands. So if we were to take this map and apply it to New Brunswick where there's more conifers, I would expect it to continue to underestimate. Maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not. Um, and then the same thing with the tree count. Um, if we were to take the, these models and apply them to like denser stands, again, maybe in New Brunswick, maybe in Quebec, um, I would expect maybe uh, they would probably underestimate tree count a little bit there too. Overall, though, I don't think we've necessarily reached like the extent of our range. And so I made a very beautiful figure in paint last night of my own personal opinion as to where these maps could be applied. I just pulled this out of the air. Um, generally, I, I suspect that these maps would work equally well in the Adirondacks uh, because it's pretty similar to the Vermont that we're already doing. Um, I suspect in Quebec, you know, we'd probably be okay. Um, like I said, we could go over into New Brunswick and I suspect we'd get good uh, tree size, biomass, volume estimates, uh, but you might start seeing uh, tree count and percent softwood start to be underestimated. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we started to apply these maps down in the mid-Atlantic, I suspect that we'd run into like these uh, kind of these assemblages of trees, like the tulip poplars that the model had never seen before and we'd run into trouble. Um, that's just my guess. <laughs> but here's the thing. I already talked about how you can retrain these models locally. You could, you, could re, you could take uh, you know, existing plots just about anywhere in the world, and you could take the models that I spent weeks or months training. Uh, you can use those coefficients, and you can just start tinkering with them. And you could probably get very good models for just about any forest environment that you can imagine. Um, and, and so what I, uh, I, I really believe that the most valuable thing that I've created here in, during my PhD is not necessarily a map of New England's forests but a deep learning model that's good at interpreting LIDAR. And it's gonna be, uh, it's, it's basically good at extracting the, the features of LIDAR that are useful for predicting forest attributes. Um, and so I would, yeah, like I said, instead of having to spend like the weeks and, and tens of thousands of training plots that I had to go through to train these models, we could probably apply them else, we could probably retrain them elsewhere with like a fraction of that, maybe a couple hundred models would get us a good, model, or a couple hundred plots would get us a good model in like the southeast or something. All right, so we, we made it through uh, the applications of the maps. Uh, now I'm going to start talking about the actual methodology behind them. Um, so uh, a question that you might have is why hasn't anyone made these maps before in this region? I showed you the map of the LIDAR acquisitions. We've had LIDAR over New England in various forms for you know almost a decade now. Um, one reason for this, we've already talked a little bit about this. Um, within our study area, there's maybe 50 different LIDAR acquisitions with all ver like very different parameters. So we've got leaf on and leaf off. We've got high density and low density. And using the kind of traditional modeling approach, so you can see there's some pretty dramatic differences. Obviously, if you're if you're measuring like height percentiles of this point cloud versus this point cloud, you're going to get very different answers. Um, so if you're building a model that can, you know, if you're building a model using leaf off LIDAR and then applying it to leaf on LIDAR, you're going to get different answers, even <coughs> over the same forest. So this is a reason that we, we don't really want hundreds of different, or dozens of different LIDAR models over the region. Um, uh, so yeah, that, that, that's been a, a problem up until now. <laughs> Uh, I kind of already talked about this. Um, 
height and proportion metrics are kind of, you know, they, they vary based on pulse density and stuff, especially seasonality. Um, I, I just wanted to remind you, this is kind of how people uh, normally do it. They take these height and uh, pulse density, uh, these height and proportion metrics, and they make a regression model against uh, uh, whatever field data they're interested in, right? Uh, but there, there are lots of problems with this technique. Um, for one thing, all these height metrics that I just have been rattling off, like, like mean height and maximum height and 80th percentile height, like half of them are all like correlated with one another. We don't want to admit it, but we're only measuring like maybe three things in the LIDAR with, with all these 50 different, this 50 different like uh, LIDAR metrics that, that look cool. Um, they, they also really don't quantify horizontal complexity. So you could take the 80th percentile of this forest, but like it's kind of a tragedy how much information you're throwing away there um, for, for that model. And like I said, they're, they're very subject to change. So phenology is a real, real issue. If you're trying to take a model leaf off and then apply it in leaf on conditions, uh, you're getting different answers with the traditional method. And so that's what I've done here. We've got a model trained with uh, kind of medium resolution uh, LIDAR data. I applied it to a one post per meter LIDAR, uh, leaf off LIDAR data set and a 12 post per meter leaf on LIDAR data set. And obviously we got different numbers here, right? 1400 megagrams of biomass, 1500 megagrams of biomass and 1700 megagrams of biomass. And we don't want that because it's the same area. It's just different remote sensing uh, uh, acquisitions. And so this is, this is kind of using the standard approach. And this is why we don't have these regional maps yet. Um, but, I used a different approach. I used uh, neural networks, and what make neural networks special, and what what make a what makes AI AI is the fact that it's able to uh, basically scan the raw data and figure out on its own what's useful for measuring the forest and what's not. And so we don't have to supply height metrics that are like going to have wild variations from one pulse one point cloud to the the next. So how do neural networks actually work? Um, well, it's not, it's not that complicated. Predictors are fed in if you're working with predictors. You could, you could feed in height metrics, for example, to a neural network. They undergo like a linear transformation similar to regression. So there's going to be, it's going to be like y equals ms plus b. Uh, you're going to have a, a, a multiplier on, on those predictors, and then you're going to add a bias to them. Uh, and then they're passed through a threshold function. And this is what makes a neural network neural. Um, these threshold functions are basically to, uh, to filter out data that's useless and to let through data that's useful. And if data passes the threshold, it sees the threshold, it, it forwards onto the next layer, and if it doesn't, it just gets discarded. Uh, and that works similarly to how a neuron in your brain works. It has a threshold for which it's willing to fire and move data forward into the next neuron in your brain. So I warned you, if we, if we had time, this was going to happen. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, convolutional neural networks are special in that they're designed to scan space. So they've got a bunch of like kernels. So this is a kernel. This is a 3D little 3D box that's going to scan the lidar. And in that box are multipliers of the lidar. And now the multipliers are just like the weights in the last one. They're going to start off as random numbers. And as the neural network trains through massive trial and error, these weights are going to become meaningful for identifying useful patterns in the lidar. Uh, and these patterns are going to correspond to whatever we're predicting. So for example, uh, this is uh, and the, the, the kind of the midway stage in a LIDAR, uh, in one of my models for predicting biomass, right? Um, convolutions have been run over this LIDAR point cloud. And what we're seeing here are red areas where the, that are kind of important. And these important areas are more likely to pass through the threshold and move further into the neural network. So we can kind of visualize what these things are actually looking at, which is kind of cool. Uh, we take convolutions on top of convolutions. We get the first ones are designed to identify patterns. The second ones are designed to identify more interesting stuff. And the, by the time you get deeper and deeper, you can start to identify really interesting features like human faces or the crowns of individual trees. Um, and one reason why this method uh, has become so popular is that uh, it's able to identify features that aren't aren't going to really vary based on uh, like background light levels or pulse density. Uh, it's able to identify features like, for example, the edges of of, of a pumpkin, um, which or the edges of trees, which aren't going to necessarily vary as much um, in different uh, conditions. 
uh, one drawback to this, this technique is that it requires a tremendous amount of training data. Uh, it took me 25,000 stem mapped plots at 28 sites to train my model. Um, and stem maps like this were often gridded up into these 10 by 10 meter training cells. Um, I did not use FIA data to train this. So the final model was very complex. Um, if, if we're talking about like coefficients or multipliers on the data, it had 20.3 million of them. Um, it was based on a model developed by Google. Um, and the model is designed to interpret not only raw LIDAR data, it will also interpret uh, corresponding satellite data. So we'll, we'll also pull in uh, Sentinel, Landsat, Landsat disturbance, and MODIS phenology um, and make, make these forest est uh, estimates uh, from all of that. Um, and one thing that's, well, all right, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so how do, how do these models compare to like a traditional approach? If we compare our traditional height metrics with random forest or with linear modeling, you can see that the deep learning outperforms it by something like 38%. And this was pretty consistent across the board no matter what we were estimating. So neural networks do work a lot better uh, for interpreting LIDAR. I'm pretty confident about that at this point. Um, one thing that's kind of cool about these things is that a single neural network can, can predict a bunch of stuff. So we can, we can train these neural networks to predict anything we want. In this case, I have trained a single neural network to predict 14 different forest attributes. So the standard approach for this LIDAR modeling is we'll have 14 different LIDAR models. You'll have a merchant volume model and a total volume model, and they're separate from one another, and they don't see one another. And then you'll get these estimates where merchantable volume is greater than total volume because the two aren't communicating at all and they're just separate models. Um, here, this is all one. This is all one model that's making these predictions, and it does cut down on the amount of like self uh, intersect like these impossible scenarios. Uh, one problem with this approach was that uh, of my fourteen forest metrics, uh, how many of these are measures of tree size? Maybe like five or six. QMD tree height. Uh, we've got two biomass estimates, a basal area estimate. All of these are kind of the same thing. So the model that I ended up training and applying only had one, was, was only going to have one estimate of tree count here, of density. Uh, and so maybe the reason that we didn't do so well with, with species and density was because uh, the, the loss function that I was optimizing was designed to really optimize uh, large trees and it's kind of too late to do that but the next phd around i'm i'm going to have a different loss <laughs> um so let's let's go back to our example we can take this neural network that i trained and apply it to our 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 stand with three different lidar acquisitions uh we see once again a, a little underestimation of biomass in low uh pulse density situations and this is what we saw on the map um it's not it's still kind of struggling in these like low pulse density situations where the structure of the trees is not like fully defined. But what we have trained here is a leaf on and leaf off model that will give you the same estimate, uh, even if, you know, regardless of uh, seasonality that you flew the LIDAR. And this is kind of a big deal because there have been some pretty contentious con debates around here about whether or not we want to fly leaf off or leaf on LIDAR, um, because then you got to like restart your whole modeling process. If you have a model in, you know, if I have a model made with main leaf off LIDAR and I want to apply it to a leaf on data set, uh, this is really the only way to go, or you have to make a new one. Um, unfortunately, all, all of the data that I ended up applying it to is leaf off in, in the first place, so we're probably not going to be emphasizing this point very much, but, you know, we could apply it to the Canadian LIDAR and, and get perfectly valid estimates. Um, so I want to uh, finish this by uh, reiterating that uh, the maps are cool, uh, but I, I think that maybe the most valuable thing here that is I've trained a neural network that can interpret LIDAR and, and some really cool future projects that people could use the neural network I trained to, to make estimates with. Uh, we can maybe use these weights from this neural network to identify individual trees, project forward, uh, forest forward and backward in time, which is what I'm working on now, uh, generate uh, new LIDAR from forest inventories, simulate different climate conditions, classify buildings and ground points, work with photometric point clouds, even self-driving cars work by, you know, identifying objects in LIDAR. So um, we've got a student here who might be uh, working on the first bit, trying to identify individual trees with uh, neural networks, and he'll probably be starting with the neural networks I trained. 
um, because uh, it's, it's pretty cool that we have now uh, a set of neural networks that can identify useful features of the forest. Um, so that's it. Uh, you might be asking yourself, uh, where can I actually get these maps? Uh, we haven't put them online yet, but that is like a high priority here. Um, right now, you can just email me and I will send them to you. They're open domain and I'm happy to share them. Uh, All together, there's something like 30 gigabytes. Um, we can also, I can also sh like share you a link uh, for Google Earth Engine. That was how I was like manipulating and moving the maps around earlier. Um, and then you could just open that link if you have a Google Earth Engine account and view the maps and manipulate them and download them yourself. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, all the maps are in the public domain. So please go ahead and ask me if you're interested in using these. Any uh, questions? Yeah, yeah. It's about validation. Yeah. So you've used 28 stands with 20,000 plots. Yeah. To build your model. Yeah. And you made this map across all of New England. And yep. then you validated it using an independent data set, which is IA. Correct. Which is right now our best estimate and the thing that the government uses and yep. researchers use it to go to. But what I'm hearing you say is that there's some errors. And the question is, where is truth? If your stuff from LIDAR is so accurate that it puts to shame what we measure with FIA on the ground, then do we, when, when do we actually go with LIDAR instead of measuring things on the ground to make estimates? Yeah, I'd say we're pretty close in some of those cases. Um, particularly in like suburban environments where the FIA just says there's no trees when there's a mm -hmm you know, a house or something around. Um, we can include the plots with no trees and we'll obviously get a massive underestimation of biomass from the FI. And we can take out the plots with trees and we'll get a massive overestimation of biomass with the FIA because then we've just assumed the whole area is forested. So obviously these maps are doing a better job in those situations. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, FI plots in general in this region have a lot of like geospatial problems. They have a lot of like inaccuracies in their plot coordinates and stuff. So I suspect even the numbers that I pulled down from those uh, plots are uh, probably, it's probably doing better than what it's saying. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say we're pretty close to, to at that point, especially with biomass. Almost all those counties were in agreement with the FIA in some way. And the ones that weren't, who knows who's wrong there, but. <laughs> Yeah, I was following up on Brian's comment. There's some recent work, I don't think it's published yet, but there's a group estimating the uncertainty in FIA's plot data. Mm. Uncertainty in diameter sites, every tree metric you can imagine. I wonder if that could be helpful. Yeah, I mean, you can get uncertainty of like a given area, but uh, yeah, uncertainty of the, the measurements would be useful. And then of course, like everyone doing this will always tell you that it's the allometry that's wrong. So, you know. I, the, the equations I'm using are already out of date. Like, I'm using FIA component ratio method one for biomass, for example, and Aaron's already made better equations for that. So, you know, you can, always, you can get wildly different estimates just by having different equations, and that doesn't make one, the model wrong, but, you know. Yeah. Um, is there any potential, do you think, using uh, neural networks to um, find course with the debris in LIDAR? Uh, it's possible if you had a good training data set. Um, you need a, a lot of training data. <laughs> uh, it's it's hard to say. It would also depend on the the pulse density of the lidar. It's uh, you can you can look at the roughness of the ground, and sometimes you can like by uh, generally, in my opinion, if you can see something by eye, you can probably train a neural network to identify it. And uh, in the higher pulse density areas, sometimes you can see some like roughness in the ground. But I wouldn't be I wouldn't be 100% certain. What people have done is uh, they've looked at basically the conditions of the canopy and then estimated, of course, what you debris from that. And they seem to get pretty good estimates from that. But it's not a direct measurement. So using LIDAR. Yeah. Any other questions for Lawrence? OK, uh, we'll be reconvening at Tim's staff room uh, shortly. And uh, thank you, Lawrence. Yeah. Please join us if you can. <laughs> Thank you.
on the schedule as well, Mr. Gardner. Uh, next one is um, Andy Kudak from U.S. Forest Service um, in, I believe it's March 13th.